Good evening from Roberts Thoe UMC. My name is Pastor Jonathan and welcome to this new series of Wednesday Night Bible Study Lives. I am so grateful that you're tuning in. The question that this video is going to seek to answer, in fact the question that this whole series is going to seek to answer, is who is the third person of God? So that's, we're going to, that's what we're going to be diving into tonight. Uh, we are live on our Facebook page at Robert Stowe UMC. We're also uh, embedding this live video to our website, robertstowumc.com forward slash live. I am going to take a second and go ahead and share this to my personal Facebook page. And I would appreciate it if you would do the same. Uh, please click like, uh, please click share. Uh, that will help us with engagement. That will help more people see and be able to join us. And we're grateful that we can be together even when we're apart through technology in this way. So, all right, here we go. I'm sharing this to my page and I wanna make it public. So be sure you uh, check your privacy settings and things like that if you wanna make the uh, video public and share it with friends and that kind of thing. Thank you so much. Uh, like I said, my name is Pastor Jonathan Hart. I'm the pastor of Robert Stowe UMC in Robert Stowe, Alabama, uh, South Alabama. And uh, if you have never tuned into our videos before, uh, we have Bible Study Live Wednesdays at six, which is what we're doing right now. And we have Worship Live on Sunday mornings at 10. We just celebrated uh, Easter. Uh, this past Sunday was the first Sunday after Easter. And tonight we're kicking off a new series of uh, Bible studies on Wednesday nights and sermons, messages on Sunday morning uh, entitled The Third Person. Our new series is called The Third Person. And the whole series is about getting to know the Holy Spirit. So where we left off in uh, Scripture is we have been going through the Gospel of John and we have been encountering Jesus through personal encounters that Jesus had with individuals in the Gospel of John. And uh, we kind of hit John chapter 11, where Jesus actually raises a man named Lazarus from the dead. And then in the very next chapter, we have Palm Sunday, which the church celebrates the Sunday before Easter. And we have all these chapters of conversation and events that took place the last week of Jesus' life, which we call Holy Week or Passion Week. And then we fast forward to chapter 19 when Jesus is arrested and crucified on Good Friday. And then we fast forward to chapter 20, which is Easter Sunday, the empty tomb. And then there's chapter 21, uh, which if you want some good content and good thought-provoking messages about what's going on in chapter 21, uh, after uh, Resurrection Sunday has already happened, check out our Daily Devo videos on our Facebook page or on our website or on our YouTube channel, Robert Stowe UMC. But all that to say, we skipped uh, some significant conversation that Jesus had with his disciples on uh, the night of Passover, when he gives us the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, and he starts doing some things and saying some things in chapter 13 that carry all the way through chapter 17. So if you have a red letter Bible, uh, or if you're on a website that has a red letter translation of the Bible, that means the words of Jesus uh, show up in red, you will notice that starting in chapter 13 of John's Gospel, Jesus starts speaking and almost every word is read through chapter 17. It's a lot of Jesus speaking, a ton of uh, really valuable stuff. And a lot of it is only found in the Gospel of John. And one of the things that Jesus says in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, is that the Father is going to send another in my name. Jesus is prepping the disciples for losing him. He's prepping the disciples for him going away, and he's saying that the Father is going to send another in his name. I want to start reading, and, and I actually want to read the whole chapter of John 14. Uh, then I'm going to dive into some stuff that I'm going to show you on the screen. So hang in there. Uh, this is going to be good, important stuff. And, and I'm going to try to break this down as much as I can to basic, basic level, because that's what I need, and I'm still struggling to understand. Um, so hang in for the reading of this chapter. Uh, if you want to open a tab, if you're on the computer or you have your phone, uh, and you can open some kind of app or another tab of your web browser, and you want to pull up a website like Bible Gateway, uh, if you have a Bible and you want to open to John chapter 14, you can read along or feel free to just listen uh, and watch as I read this and we'll, uh, we'll figure out some of what he's trying to say together tonight. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And then Thomas speaks up and says, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, why do you think he says that? Well, because he's saying, you know me, therefore you know the Father. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Uh, John's gospel is full of miracles and signs. That's one thing that he focuses on as he writes his gospel. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Put your finger on that when we're coming back to it. The world, the, the Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Put your finger there too. That's verse 17. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. And then he continues the conversation as they leave the upper room where they've shared dinner together. And Jesus continues to talk to his disciples and then eventually pray with them in his presence. So that's John chapter 14. Um, I do want to look at one note. Forgive me. I'm doing this on the spot um, because I saw something interesting. And I just want to make sure that I... There, there, and then verse 28. Yeah, okay. So uh, my, my Bible has some cross-references and footnotes. Uh, yours may too. I like to take advantage of those and see what they say. So I was just looking at that for a moment. Um, I want to go ahead and invite you. I have my laptop here. I can see the comments uh, as everyone is joining in. Hey, Marin. Uh, hey, Joy. Hey, Linda. Hey, Susan. Hey, Barbara. Hey, Barbara. Hey, Michelle. 
Uh, thank you all so much for being with us. Uh, please engage as we go along tonight. Uh, if I ask a question, it's not rhetorical. You can actually answer. If you have a thought, if you have a comment, if you have an insight, um, if you're listening to me going, wow, Jonathan, you, you really don't know what you're talking about. Um, here, let me help you. I would love for you to help me along as I stumble through this. One thing that I want to say about this whole series starting out, um, and I, I knew that this would happen, and I've chosen to do this series anyway because I believe God has told me to do it um, and, and prompted me to spend some time just on the person of the Holy Spirit, is that this is a daunting, daunting task. I don't know where in the world I felt the confidence to try to do a series or, or even one night, even one Bible study or one sermon to try to explain the Holy Spirit. Uh, the moment you try to put him in the confines of human understanding, you've already failed in the effort. So just know that I know that going in. But we're going to do our best because God does want us to know him. Uh, he has revealed himself. He's given us his word. He wants us to seek understanding and to grow in our knowledge of him. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, I in no way intend to uh, come across as, as if we're embarking on a comprehensive journey where we will know everything about the Holy Spirit because that would take eternity and we just can't do it. But I do think there are some basic things that we can know about the Holy Spirit. And first of all, um, this idea of the Trinity. So if you've never heard of the Trinity before, um, in Christianity since its early days, and, and as, especially as you read through the New Testament, the writings of Paul, in Trinitarian form, uh, God in three forms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has always been in the story. He's been there since the beginning. Um, and, and the Gospels tell us that the Son, Jesus, who came at a certain point in human history, was always with the Father and the Spirit from the beginning. So God is eternal. That means the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all eternal. Uh, there was never a time when one of them existed without the others. Um, and they are all God. So we're going to try to wrap our heads around this tonight as we begin this journey together and just try to start understanding what in the world that means. And this is an illustration that I have found helpful. And so I'm going to ask you, um, and I mean this, this is interactive. Um, what is this? What is this? This is also an egg, right? Um, why do these two pictures look different? Um, and, and to give you the benefit, in reality, we actually don't know if this is a full egg because you can only see what part? The shell, right? You can only see the shell. So for all we know, somebody drilled a hole in the back of these eggs and pulled out what's inside and all we're looking at as the shell. But if I show you this picture and say, what is this? You're going to say egg, right? But you also said the same thing on this picture, right? W would any of you say that this is, is this is this egg? This is the yolk, right? This is the egg yolk, yes? And, and what's this called? Uh, if you get older and you start having to eat more heart healthy, you actually take this out and you only eat this part, and this part's called the egg white, right? Uh, you might eat uh, an omelet made of only egg whites, right? But is this still an egg? Is the yolk egg? Is the white egg? But is the yolk the white? Yes or no? Is the yolk the white or are they not the same thing? And, and, and are the yolk and the white the shell? Are they the same thing? No. But are they all egg? Yes? Okay, I know this might seem elementary, uh, but this is what God and eggs have in common. Right. So all three of those are what we would call egg. And if I show you a picture of any three forms or parts of what we would call an egg, you would still identify the picture as egg. I'm looking at an egg when I'm looking at the yolk. I see egg when I'm looking at the white. I see egg when I'm looking at the shell. I see an egg. But the, the shell is not the yolk and the yolk is not the white and the white is not the shell. Right. Um, so. Another way that I have uh, explained this to preschoolers when I'm doing chapel is a little rhyme. I, I use my fingers because I don't need a prop. Uh, I carry this prop around with me all the time. And this is my hand, right? And all of this is Jonathan. Um, if the FBI took my fingerprints and you were to run a fingerprint scan, um, no matter which finger you ran my fingerprint, uh, it would come up Jonathan Hart, right? These, these are my fingerprints. These are my fingers. And this is my hand. Um, 
So, so what part of my body is this? Finger. Uh, what part of my body is this? Finger. What part of my body is this? Finger. Um, and, and I am blessed. I have all 10 of my fingers. Um, but is, is this my index finger? And is my index finger the same as my middle finger? No. My ring finger? No. They are three, fring three fingers. So I teach the preschoolers this little bit. All of these are my fingers, but my index finger is not my middle finger, is not my ring finger. All right? Does that make sense? But here's where um, God departs from the simple and silly and very limited images of eggs and fingers. This is why these illustrations are so difficult and so limited uh, and why, why I hesitate sometimes even to use them. Uh, it's because uh, God is not an egg and God is not a finger. All three persons of God are persons. God is three persons. And if you've never heard the hymn or if you've never heard any hymns, uh, we have a hymn that we sing um, called Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to thee. And we say, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. There's this icon. Uh, it's actually a Russian icon. Uh, I happen to be a Protestant Methodist, um, and we don't focus on icons a lot. But I, Sorry, I'm trying not to tangle up my mic. Um, but I fell in love with this icon a few years ago because this is an icon uh, by a guy named Rublev, and it is the icon of the Trinity. And, and the imagery you could talk about for hours, and people have, so you're welcome to Google this. Again, the image is Rublev's icon of the Trinity, uh, Rublev's Trinity. But what I love about it, my favorite thing about this icon, this image, um, an icon is not an idol, by the way. Um, God is very specific in, in the scriptures that we are not to worship idols or, um, or even really di to direct our gaze at idols. No graven images. This is not a graven image. Uh, it is an icon. So it is an artistic expression that points us to the greater reality of God. Um, same way we, we put architecture in sanctuaries and church buildings and, and uh, you know, we use the, the arts and worship and ministry all the time. So this is an expression of that. And what I love about it, my favorite thing about it, I have two favorite things about it. My first favorite thing is that even though Jesus was the only person of God to ever become human, this icon represents God as three persons in relationship with himself. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all seated together at a table, a very communal activity, an activity all of us can relate to, uh, eating together, and there's even a cup, a shared cup together on the table. But the second thing I love, my, my second favorite thing about this icon, and again, you could talk about the details for hours, is that it's a four-sided table, if you look closely, and this side is open to the viewer. It's literally as if Rublev, Rublev, in crafting this icon, was portraying God as three persons, inviting you, the viewer, to pull up a chair and join him at the table. I just love that. I love that image of, uh, of Adam, when God created Adam before he had even created Eve, of God saying, Adam, pull up, pull up a chair at my table. Uh, let's do life together. Let's be in relationship together. So um, when I created a graphic for this sermon series, I started with a very simple graphic. In fact, um, I, should have, I should have put it up here to show you. I can't do that. I wish I had. But uh, it was a very simple graphic, and it had a human outline with a flame inside the human silhouette. And, and it was cool looking and I liked it, uh, but I showed it to my wife and she said, I don't like it. And I said, why don't you like it? And she said, well, I think because the title of the series is the third person, it makes it look like the outline of a human is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's not a human. And, and I, I, I have a lot of resistance in thinking of the Holy Spirit in any kind of limited parameters. And what's amazing is that's exactly what Jesus chose to do. God in Jesus chose to inhabit limited human parameters. Now you say limited, he did miracles. Absolutely. He had the power of God walking around in human form, but he still took on human weaknesses. The scripture says that, that he took on human weakness. That he, uh, in Philippians 2, read the Jesus Creed of Philippians 2, he humbled himself taking on the form of a servant. God condescended to use a fancy word. He came down and got in the muck and mire of our life and put on human flesh, human weakness, 
um, put on a body that would bleed if cut, that would hurt if someone struck him, which they did, and would certainly endure agonizing pain uh, in the process of crucifixion. God the Father has never taken on that form. The Holy Spirit has never taken on that form. But if we don't think of the Holy Spirit in personal terms, we're missing who he really is. So the reason I went with this image is because it's, it's chaotic, uh, it's wild looking. There ha there's the image of the dove right above the wording, uh, but you have the triangle, which is the image of the three persons of God. Um, but the Holy Spirit is wild and chaotic and unpredictable, um, but he's still a person. And so one of my questions tonight for us is what is the difference between a person and a human? <laughs> God made us as humans in his image. And what that means is God has personhood and he put that personhood in us. Now our personhood has gone bad. And so most of us, when we think of personhood, we think of humanity. And we, when we think of humanity, we think of issues. We have issues, but there's a lot of good about us. And, and sometimes when we think of our humanity, we throw the baby out with the bathwater, literally. Because we think in our cursed condition, everything about us is bad and everything about us is wrong. And sometimes we, we uh, take things that I think have to do with personhood and we think that they're a result of the curse or they're a result of us being human and God's nothing like that. We have emotions. God doesn't have emotions. Well, of course God has emotions. I mean, read the Bible. Uh, there is not a version of God in the Bible, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, that is emotionless. Where do you think we got ours? Uh, the Bible even talks about God getting angry, a good kind of angry, a righteous kind of angry, uh, as all parents should get when their children are treated unjustly. Um, laughter, humor, joy, um, what, it, what it means to have a heart, what it means to have a will, a mind to do something, um, desires and an intention to carry out those desires. God has all that. And even the persons of God that never became human have all that, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had all that in human form, and Jesus showed, it, showed us what it meant for the personhood of God to take on humanity without the issues. That blows my mind, and it's really cool. Uh, Colossians says he was the visible image of the invisible God. Problem with the Holy Spirit is he is not the visible image of the invisible God. So we have a hard time with him. There's this amazing book called Paul, the Spirit, and the People of God by Gordon Fee, and he talks about uh, the Holy Spirit and the writings of Paul, which Paul uh, gives us probably greater understanding of the Holy Spirit and who he is and why he matters for the church and us today as Christians. The, the person that Jesus told us in John 14 would be coming, sent by the Father in his name to take the place of Jesus on earth. Um, it's, a, it's a great book and has a lot of insight, but Paul wrote more about him than anybody. So Gordon Fee really focuses on the writings of Paul. Uh, this is a great book, a great resource, and it's not just for scholars. It's not just an academic. Quite, I, can, I can quite understand, but the Holy Spirit is a gray, oblong blur. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like your whole life, if you've ever heard of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is just this gray, oblong blur. And then he talked about... Um, this uh, children's moment on Pentecost Sunday in a local church, a good friend was trying to portray the reality of the Spirit by blowing on a piece of paper and letting it fly away. The Spirit is like that, she was saying to the children. It's like the wind, very real in its visible effects, even though the wind itself is invisible. At which point this six-year-old child blurted out, but I want the wind to be uninvisible. And Gordon Fee turned to his wife and whispered, exactly, what a profound moment. How often uh, we all feel this way about God as spirit, as Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to be uninvisible. So a lot of times we think that the Holy Spirit is impersonal because of the images for him in scripture. Wind, breath, fire, water, oil, a dove, when he descended. Jesus the Son at, the, at, at his baptism, uh, and he heard the voice of the Father affirming him. That's a great Trinitarian image because we have the Father speaking over the Son identity as the Holy Spirit also manifests in this physically visible form. Not a human form, but some kind of visible form. So we have a lot of images for the Holy Spirit, but most images and that's what I think I want God, I, I, what I think God wants to correct in our thinking. There we go. So back to John 14, 
Um, and back to this idea of the Holy Spirit as person. So one thing I notice in verse 6 of John 14, John 14 verse 6, is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You remember that? Did you catch that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then down in verse 17, Jesus uh, he says in verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. But then he says in verse 17 that he's the spirit of think. Paul refers to the spirit, the Holy Spirit, as the spirit of Christ, the spirit of Jesus. He is the spirit of Christ. Now, he's not like the invisible soul of Jesus as if he's a, a part of Jesus, uh, but Jesus is still Jesus and the Holy Spirit is just a part of his personhood. The Holy Spirit is a separate person, but he's the spirit of Christ. Oh, this is making my brain hurt. Is it making your brain hurt? Um, but, but Jesus is talking this oneness language. So the spirit is another who's going to be sent in his name by the father. So the father's in heaven. Jesus is going to go be with the father. The father's going to send another to be with us. But that other is the spirit of Jesus. And as Paul says in Romans 8, the very same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit is the person who performed the miracle of Easter. He's the one that raised Jesus from the dead. And Paul says in Romans 8, he will also raise our lives uh, to resurrection, eternal life. He will give life to our mortal bodies. So verse 17 says the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Now, what does that mean? Jesus is talking about a person of God that the father has not sent yet, but he says you will know him because he lives with you. He is currently with you. Why do you think Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was already with the disciples? because he's with them in Jesus. Jesus is walking around one with the Father and one with the Spirit. Therefore, if they are with Jesus, they are with the Holy Spirit. But what does he put in future language? He lives with you, he is with you, and will be what? In you. There is a huge theme that runs throughout the entire Bible that God is with his people. But what Jesus is saying is with the coming of the Holy Spirit, God will no longer only be with his people. He will be in them. And that's a prophetic promise. Look in the Old Testament prophets and see that. Um, I shouldn't say things like that and not be able to tell you where. I'm sorry. Google it. Um, I'm thinking Ezekiel and or Jeremiah and or and Greek for breath and wind is also the same word as spirit. So that's why wind and breath are, are such a powerful image for the Spirit. God is going to breathe His Spirit once again. This, again, this new creation image that John plays with a lot. That in Jesus, God is making us new. That God is once again breathing the breath of life into us, but that breath is His very Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about in coming weeks at some point in this series. Uh, we're going to get into music theory a little bit and how two notes can actually exist at the same time, not competing with each other. So it's not that God is replacing your personhood or your personality with himself and his own. It's that he is inhabiting us so that our personality and his personality fuse together and the same that Jesus says is true of himself becomes true of us. And that is the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And one thing that you see throughout this whole section uh, of this of this discourse of Jesus, this long conversation where he's talking to his disciples and even praying for them of John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. One thing that you see happen over and over and over is Jesus talking about oneness. As he prepares to go, one of his greatest desires, one of his top three things that he prays for, for us and for his first disciples and then everyone who would ever believe in him is oneness that the same oneness that he has with the father and the spirit that we would have that with him and therefore we would also have it with the father and the spirit that that as jesus and the father and the spirit are one that we would be in him and therefore we would also be one with each other and that's why the church is supposed to have such a radical witness in the world we are supposed to have a kind of die he's about to be raised and he's about to go back to the father 
And then one day he's coming again. And in the meantime, between those two historical events in our earthly timeline, he is going to give us the Holy Spirit. The Father is going to send the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus to be with us and in us so that the very Spirit of Christ can dwell in us and on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So we're going from with language to in language. And Jesus says this is a very good thing. In verse 6, he actually says specifically that this person he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. He says the counselor, uh, which that word counselor, we could do a whole night just on that. But uh, in Greek, it's parakletos, or in English, paraclete. Uh, it means advocate, but not just a legal advocate. Uh, that, that term can be limited. Not just helper. That term can be limited. Um, well, helper's good. Comforter can be a little limited in the way that we think of that and, and the, the expression of what he's doing in that role as comforter. But, but he's our comforter. He's our counselor. He's our helper. Uh, he's our paraclete. He's our advocate. He's the one that fights alongside. He even fights in us and through us and for us. And in Romans, uh, Paul says that not just Jesus the Son is seated at the Father's right hand interceding for us, but the Holy Spirit is also inside us interceding for us. That means he's praying for us even as we're walking around with him inside of us. You ever feel like your prayers don't work? Bank on the fact that if, if you've allowed the Holy Spirit to live in you. And I don't just mean you've given him a, a parcel on your huge plot of land to stay in the back corner. I mean, if you've allowed him to come in and make his home, as Jesus said, the Father and I will come in and make our home with you. If you've allowed the Holy Spirit to move in and take up residence and be the controlling agent in your life, his personality, the personality of God merged with yours, that he is directing everything about your life. If you've allowed that to happen, you can count on the fact that when you pray, even if you don't know if your prayers are good, even if you don't know if they're right, even if you don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit is praying with you. Uh, and he's a paraclete. He, he fights for you and alongside you. That's such a great image. And Jesus says in verse uh, 26 of John 14, but the counselor or paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I have said to you. He, he will remind you of everything I've commanded you. He will help you obey, which is what Jesus has said. If you love me, you'll obey. Love, obey, love, obey. And then he says, peace I give with you. That's an incredibly comforting, comforting verse. And he says, you heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. Listen to this, John 14, verse 28, underline this. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I want to conclude here because this is powerful. I think this may be one of the most powerful thoughts that I share with you uh, in this video tonight. Jesus says that if we really knew Jesus and if we really loved him, we would be glad that he's going away. On a personal note, I just lost my dad uh, last Sunday. When you love someone, you do not want them to go away, <laughs> right? I mean, if they love Jesus, they are not glad if he's telling them that this is a funeral. You thought this was the Passover meal. You thought we were gonna have dinner together. I'm telling you, this is a funeral reception. That's not what anybody wants to hear when you love someone. And even if you know that you're about to die or about to go away, that's never a fun conversation to have. Parting uh, is sorrow, right? Um, but Jesus says, if you knew and loved me, if you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. I don't just think, as I take that verse at face value, I don't just think he's saying, guys, I'm gonna have so much fun in the presence of the Father that if you really loved me, you would want me to go. Um, it's gonna be thousands of years before I come back, but I like get to go to Disneyland. And if you really love someone, you're happy for them when they get to go to Disneyland and you don't right? That's how I can read that verse. I don't think that's right. I think what Jesus is saying is, if you love me, you would be glad I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I am, and uh, he can do more through me if the Holy Spirit is in you. And if you really loved me, you wouldn't just want to stop at with. You would want to take the next step to end. You don't just want me to be with you. That's what these past couple of years have been. These past couple of years have been amazing. Uh, I have been with you. 
But what I'm telling you is we're about to level up and enter a whole new ball game where if you will let me go and let me go to the Father, the Father will send another in my name who will not just be with you, but he will be my spirit, my presence, the very presence and personhood and personality of God inside you. You won't just be close to me. You will be one with me. And if you loved me, wouldn't you want our relationship to go to that level? That's the invitation of Jesus. That's who the third person of God is. He's the Holy Spirit. He's the counselor, the advocate, the paraclete, the helper, the comforter, who is the very presence, power, personality of God that chooses to live in us. And our bodies, as Corinthians say, uh, the, the Corinthian letters say, I think, is it first or second? I always get first and second Corinthians mixed up. Uh, I think it's in chapter 12 or chapter 6 of one of those that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. The reason I don't know that and have to know that tonight is because I'm going to preach it in a couple of weeks. So we have some time. We're going to dive more in detail in that. But our bodies are meant to be temples of the Holy Spirit. So I think that's an incredibly promising um, prospect that Jesus is saying, if you really loved me, you would be glad I'm going to the Father. Because if I go to the Father, I'm not with you anymore, but he'll send the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, I can be in you. And wouldn't that be better? I hope you've gotten something out of tonight. I would love to know how this teaching has impacted you. I would love to know if God shared a word of invitation or challenge. If you feel challenged by God, if you feel uh, if you feel like he's calling you to do something tangible uh, or respond to this in some way, if you learned something and you were just impacted, uh, share your favorite thought from tonight. Share questions. Uh, we're just getting started. This is Bible study number one. I haven't even preached sermon numbers, reflections, questions, and we will uh, continue this journey together as we go from being with God to being in God and having him in us. This is Pastor Jonathan of Robertsdale UMC. God bless you tonight. Grace and peace.